morning, I have a, a message, a unique title. It's entitled, This Present Evil World. How many would agree with me this morning that we're living in a present evil world? Let me see your hand. How many would agree with that? Well, we're going to see some amazing things as the Word of God is going to prove it, but we're also going to see that God has a plan by which he's going to fix it. And we're going to see some, abuse, some, some beautiful things this morning. Now, I'm a topical teacher. I deal with uh, topics. I'm going to give you three topics we're going to cover this morning. First, I'm going to define this present evil world. I'm going to show you from the scripture the state of the world. Where are we based on scripture? I'm going to show you this is a present evil world, and the Bible testifies to it. Then I'm going to show you how the world became so evil. Uh, many people are blaming Father God for an evil world. Many people think that God is not in control, and we're going to see today uh, that's not the case. And then last, we're going to look at Bible prophecy reveals God's remedy for the end of an, I mean, for, for an evil world. God's going to bring an end. And, and as a matter of fact, God's uh, plan and process has already started. But we're going to show you this. And again, it's going to help you give an answer to, to a world that don't uh, understand what's going on. I want to first bring in our prophecy chart. And again, this is a chart of time. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit and show you where we're going to start. We're actually dealing today with the present earth, the state of the earth. And through God's prophecies, we're in what's called the church age. And the next, next event is that of the rapture of the church. And we have the tribulation, the millennial kingdom. But we're headed to the eternal world, the eternal state the new heavens and the new earth. But today we're gonna to look at where we are in regards to the present earth. And I think it's gonna really help you to give you some understanding in regards to uh, uh, where we are. I want you to bow your hearts as we ask the Lord to bless his word, okay? Father God, we love you. And again, I thank you so much for this wonderful time of study. Lord, it's truly a privilege first to stand before you. And Lord, it's an honor to stand before your people. Holy Spirit, as we go into the word today, I ask that you would open the scriptures to our hearts. Lord, answer questions, dissolve doubts, remove fears, dear God. Lord, help us understand where we are. Let us see your plan, your remedy for a sick world. Help us to communicate this message to a lost world that don't understand. Lord, many are blaming you and they don't really understand. Help us to communicate truth to them. Now, Lord, we come against every scheme, every strategy of the devil. And we bind his attempts to hinder. And Lord, we ask for an open heaven this morning over your word. And we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Many today blame God wrongfully for the woes of this present evil world. They say if, if God is all powerful and in control, why doesn't he fix everything? Why does he allow all this death? Why do the good suffer with the bad? It is this hostility toward God that shows uh, their gross ignorance of God's word. The Bible gives us uh, the answers regarding how this evil world came about. Many would be shocked to know how that, that it was man who brought about these woes upon himself. Father God is clear and unapologetic regarding the truth he reveals about this evil world. He is also clear about how he will fix the problem. We must first see the present evil world as revealed in God's word. And I'm going to show you that this morning. Father God, he, he's, he's amazing because he doesn't hide nothing from us. Uh, he, he, he reveals the state of where we are uh, uh, in this world. And we're going to see that as the scriptures go. Now, many people fit this category. Uh, this guy says, some God of love you are. Why did you do this? He's blaming God for death. I met a man one time, this man told me, he said, me and that man got a problem because that man killed my mother. And I said, sir, God didn't kill your mother. He said, what? I said, the scripture says that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God didn't kill your mother. The end result of my time with this man, he received Christ as his savior. But for years, no one challenged his belief. He thought God took his mother. And many people blame God and they blame him falsely. In the book of Galatians, chapter 1, the Apostle Paul gave us a powerful statement here. Chapter uh, 1, verse 4, he said, who gave himself, talking about Jesus, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God, our Father. It, the scripture says here that he came to deliver us from this present evil world. I like it from the New Living Translation. It says Jesus gave him gave his life for our sins, just as God 
uh, as our Father God had planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. See, the scripture is clear. We're living in an evil world. You know, saints, this world is not your friend. Uh, this, world, this world does not like you. Uh, it's an evil world. We're going to see why. The scriptures are quite clear when it talks about it. Uh, John got into it in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. Listen to what he says about this world. He said, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. He said, we're children of God, but the whole world is it's just lying. It's just bathing in wickedness. I like it from the NIV. It says, we know that we are the children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Saints, we're in hostile territory and we need to understand that. You need to understand where we are. And, and again, this world does not, it does not love us. But again, Jesus, we're going to see he died for this world. Now, look at this. This is amazing. Again, I'm showing you the present evil world. You know, even our beautiful little babies, you know, they are born. Look at this. Psalms 51, 5. He said, behold, I was shapen in iniquity. He said, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, he's not saying his mother conceived him in adultery or nothing like that. He's saying his mother, she was born in sin. And when she, and when she uh, 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 was pregnant with him, that same sin nature that was on her passed on to him. He said, I was shapen in iniquity. This term iniquity, it means immoral or grossly unfair behavior. It's a den of iniquity. It means wickedness, sinfulness, immorality, sin, crime, transgression, wrongdoing, offense, evil. He said, I was shaping in iniquity. When I was born, I was, uh, you know, I came out, I was, I was in sin. Every one of us was born in sin. Now look at this picture. See this baby? Uh, this baby was somebody's bouncing baby boy. A mom and a dad, I guarantee when this child was born, they were so happy to have a son. But the scripture says that they were, we were born, all of us born in sin, born in iniquity. Look at that picture and you'll be surprised to know who this baby was. Look at this. This is Adolf Hitler as a baby. 18, eight, uh, 1889. Who would have thought that this bouncing baby boy would have become a world murderer of Jews? like he was. The scripture says iniquity is bound. This is one reason why God command parents to train your kids and raise them up in the admonition of God. Train them biblical principles, live a godly life before them. But you got to understand we all were born in sin. Look at this next one. Jeremiah 17, 19 says the heart is desperately is, is deceitful uh, above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Even your heart, he says, that heart, it is, it is desperately wicked. Don't put no confidence in your heart. Uh, that heart will break you. It'll break your heart every time. Uh, it's desperately wicked. The Bible says it is. We're going to see some, some other things. Look at this. Look at this next one. Look at this one. Proverbs twenty two fifteen. 15. It says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction should drive it far from him. You know, uh, people don't operate with this biblical principle. I'm not talking about abusing, but I'm talking about disciplining a child. But see, a child left to himself, the Bible says, will bring his parents to an open shame. You know, you don't have to teach Johnny how to smoke. Uh, Johnny, Johnny is, is in his DNA. We again, we're, we're in a world that's 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 corrupted, a world that's in sin. The Bible does not hide it. Look at this. The Apostle Paul said in Romans seven, verse 18, he said, for I know that in me, he says, that is in my flesh, do well no good thing. This was the apostle, the apostle of apostles, the, the, this great apostle who studied under Gamaliel. He was a Greek scholar. This man, this man, he was a, he, he was, he was, a, he was, he was, a, he, he knew the law, but he said, in myself, there's no good things. In my flesh is no good thing. The Bible says, scripture says, uh, uh, have no confidence in the flesh. Your flesh will let you down every time. It'll let you down every time. We're in a sick world. We're in a dark world. Look at this. Now here, the apostle Paul, he's going to give us the epitome of the flesh and of a sick and dying world. Look at this. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. These are the works of the flesh that are manifest. He said, now, to, uh, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, Harry Potter, I just throw that in there, <laughs> hateful, variance, uh, emulation, wrath, 
strife, seditions, her heresies, envying, murderers, drunkenness, ri uh, uh, revelings, and such alike, of which I tell you before, he says, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is the epitome of evil in our flesh. That's why I said you cannot put no confidence in your flesh, the right situation, the right attitude. And if you yield to the flesh, you would do horrible things. Listen, put no confidence in the flesh. And we're going to see now. I know it's looking, I know it's looking bleak and, and dark, but just hang in with me. I'm going to give you some hope in the end. Ephesians chapter 6, look what Paul said here. Chapter 6, verse number 12, he said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, there are spiritual wickedness. There are, are, are um, uh, principalities that are over regions. You wonder why certain nations are, 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 are steep in, in idolatry and different types of sin. It's because of principalities in high places. They have control over certain regions. Listen, saints, we, we're, 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 we're not, not in friendly territory. Scriptures are quite clear about this present world. Look at this next one. Ephesians 2, verse number 2. Paul said, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. I like this from the New Living Translation. It says, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit that worketh in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. When people refuse to obey God, there's an automatic commander. You know something, when I got saved, that was the first time I saw the devil. I, I didn't see the devil until I got saved. When I got saved, then I realized how much control the devil had over my life. He was the puppet master and I was a puppet. The devil controlled my life. I was, I was, I was, I was doing things that I didn't want to do. He was the puppet master. Yeah, those who refuse to serve him, they will be automatically controlled. Look at this one, Ephesians, I mean, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 4, verse 4, Paul said this. He said, in whom the God, lowercase g-o-d, the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The scripture says here that the God of this world has blinded the minds of He's blinded the minds of those that don't believe. Now, I like this verse from the NIV. It says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that display the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Listen, saints, Satan is the God of this world. Now, when they say God of this world, it does not mean that Satan is all powerful. God is still sovereign. He's still a God over, over all the earth. But God has allowed even the devil a, a, a place, a, 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 a boundaries. He can't go over certain boundaries that God has allowed. But I'm going to show you in a few minutes how the devil gained control of the world. And as he did, this beautiful world that was once beautiful and precious, it became an evil world. We're walking again on hostile territory. So how the world became evil. How did it happen? How did it happen? Adam was the federal head of humanity whom God put in charge of the whole world. But because of his actions, the actions of this one man, sin entered in this once perfect and beautiful creation of God. As a result of Adam's disobedience, Satan gained control of planet Earth. Adam chose to disobey, and that choice was a very powerful, uh, powerful one, resulting in grave consequences. The will of mankind is the greatest power that Father God has given to each and every one of us. We must make, uh, make wise choices. Uh, if we don't, the wrong choice will destroy our lives forever. Adam, Father Adam, he made an eternal decision and his lineage, every one of us, all of mankind, has been suffering and paying the consequences ever since. 
You know, the first sacrifice God made was in the garden when he sacrificed uh, an animal to cover Adam and Eve's sin. And I believe that that was an atonement uh, or covering for Adam and Eve's first uh, I mean, sin. I do believe we will see them in eternity. And I made a statement this morning. I said, when I go to heaven, I want to sit down and talk with Father Adam. I want to say, Father, what were you thinking? Do you realize what kind of situation you put us in? We're going to see a loving God, though. A loving God had an answer. Now, but we're looking at how did this happen? So to look at it, we're going to see what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. And again, we're going to look here in the garden. This is Genesis chapter 3, verses uh, 2 through 5. It says, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for, uh, for, God, uh, for God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be also as God's little g, O D. It says, Knowing good and evil. Look at the next part of this, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, uh, and, it ple and, and, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree, uh, and, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, this is amazing, saints. In the garden, Adam allowed the devil to talk to his wife. I say, husbands, today, don't let the devil talk to your wife. Shut him down. Close him down. Don't let the devil talk to your wife because it caused major problems. What's so amazing to me is that Father Adam was there in the garden watching this situation and he yielded. And as a result of it, it created a present evil situation. Look at verse 16 and 17 of Genesis 3. He said, God begin to, God, God's going to pass out judgments now as a result of Adam and Eve's uh, 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 disobedience. He said here in verse uh, 16, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children. Uh, uh, God said, women, when you bring forth children, you're going to bring forth in sorrow and pain. That was part of the curse because they disobeyed. He said, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife and have eaten of the tree of which I command thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Listen to what God said. He said, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Now, Adam, again, was the federal head of humanity. Adam, in a sense, was the God of this earth. God gave him full charge and dominion over planet Earth. He named all the animals, the Bible said. But Father Adam, when he yielded and disobeyed God, he caused sin to come into the earth. And as a result, everything that was under Adam's dominion, God cursed it. That was a curse that was placed on it. God cursed this, uh, this, uh, 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 this beautiful world. He said, your ground, Adam, is going to be cursed. Well, look what he did to the ground, verse 18. God told him, Adam, he said, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, unto thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field, and in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, and for dust thou art, and unto the dust thou shalt return. God told Adam, Adam, because you disobeyed me, death has now entered into your being. Adam, you came from the dust. And Adam, you're going to return to the dust. You know, saints, it was never God's will for mankind to ever die. But when Father Adam sinned, a death sentence entered into mankind. And that death sentence has passed upon every one of us. But not only that, but not only unto Adam, but also everything that he was, had control over. The beautiful rose bush. It didn't have thorns in the beginning. But as a result of sin, thorns and thistles entered God's beautiful creation. As you look around, say, you can see we're again living in this present evil world. Look at this amazing truth that the Apostle Paul reveals in Romans 5, verses 12 through 14. Paul said, wherefore, as by one man's sin, this is Adam's sin. He said, sin entered into the world. So it wasn't God that brought about this situation. It was Adam. Father Adam had dominion. 
He yielded that dominion and sin entered into the world. Look what he says, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was, uh, was in the world, but sin uh, was not imputed where there was no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, to David, to Jeremiah, to my father, to me, to my children. Death reigned. Death was passed on. You know, our kids were born in sin. This death sentence was passed on, and it started with Father Adam. See, this world... It became contaminated with sin, infected with sin as a result of one man's choice. You got to know something today. Every one of us, they have the same choice that Father Adam has. Every one of us have a choice either to accept God's way or to reject his way. But if you accept God's way, you'll learn God's purpose for your life. If you reject his way, you, you will be controlled by the devil and the powers of darkness. Listen, we're in a, we're, 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 we're in a hostile territory. Look at this. Verse 18, God said, he said, uh, uh, Paul writing, he said, therefore, as by the offense of one, because of Adam's offense, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Every one of us was born with a death sentence on us. Every one of us was born going to hell. But I thank God, saints. I thank God for his love and his grace. Because God, I'm going to show you in a little bit, God did something. God fixed this problem. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to die in sin. God fixed it. And we're going to see again his love. As I shared earlier, not only was Adam uh, 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 affected, uh, uh, infected by sin, not only did death enter Adam, but death entered into the creation. People say, well, if God's in control, why are there tsunamis? Why are there floods, floods? You know, why are there earthquakes? Why are volcanoes erupting? Why is all this stuff? If God was a God in love, he would stop all of this. Yeah, God's a sovereign God. Let me show you. Look at this. Because of Adam, look at this. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 20 and 21. He says, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing, but by reason of him who had subjected to the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the liberty, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Here, uh, the Apostle Paul is telling us that the whole creation fell subject because of Adam's sin. See those thorns went into the went into the rose bush. The rose bush didn't want those thorns, but because Adam was the federal head, all of creation was contaminated. I like this verse from the NIV. It says, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice. The creation didn't want to be infected by sin, but Adam had control. And because of Adam's choice, it plunged creation. He says, but by the, uh, but by the will uh, of the one who, who, uh, uh, who subjected it in hope. It says that the, that the creation itself shall be liberated from its bondage, to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. There's coming a day that this corrupt world, this present evil world is going to be delivered of its bondage. See, the Bible said that the earth is groaning and travailing. The earth is groaning and travailing because it's waiting for its change. The, the scripture said that the creation is waiting to see the manifestation of the sons of God. Because Christ has come, the world has hope for change. You know, there's coming a day where there, there will not be thorns and thistles ever again, a part of the, the new world. It's amazing. Now, we look at the last part of this. Bible prophecy reveals God's remedy for an evil world. Again, I don't want to leave you, you know, in a negative light. You know, that, you know, we've seen all this evil the Bible reveals about the world. We see how it happened through Adam, uh, disobedience. But God, uh, we're going to see the love of God. God loved us so much that he fixed this thing. Look at this. God had a plan which is revealed through the study of Bible prophecy. His plan was to redeem mankind and his creation back to himself. If Adam made the choice to disobey him, that choice would plunge God's creation into sin, corruption, sickness, evil, uh, and ultimately death uh, with eternal separation from God. But Father God didn't want mankind to be separated from him for all eternity. Therefore, he prepared a way for mankind to come back into his presence, even before Adam fell. 
Now, this is amazing. So we're going to see here that before Adam and Eve fell in the garden, God had already had a plan in his mind that if Adam made the wrong choice, I'm going I'm to fix it. I'm going I'm to redeem mankind. I'm going to do something that's going to allow man to come back to me with the choice. This was the very, uh, 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 his plan required his son, Jesus Christ, to take our sins and to die on the cross. This was the very reason Jesus came into the world. He came to fulfill what was already pre-written in the scripture. That was prophecy. His whole life was pre-written. It was God's instructions written in advance to redeem mankind from sin. We're going to see, saints, that even before Adam and Eve bit of the fruit, God in his love and care for humanity had already had a plan to redeem man if Adam made the wrong choice. Look at this. This is Revelation chapter 13. Now, this is at the midpoint of the tribulation. The people he's talking about here are those who will worship the Antichrist. But this one verse is going to give us a clue into the wisdom of God. Look at this. Revelation 13, verse 8, he says, and all that dwell upon the earth, this is during the tribulation, worship him. They're going to worship the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You know, saints, God had already slain his son in case man sinned. In other words, God says, what I'm going to do, if Adam sinned, uh, I'm going to allow my son to die to redeem man. God had already worked this thing out. It was already, it was already in the plan. God said, if, if Adam made the wrong choice, I mean, I wish Father Adam would have made the right choice because he would be here today. But because he did, it, it, it changed the situation. But God had a plan. Look at this. First Peter chapter one, verse 20, uh, verse 19 and 20. He says, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily, listen at this, was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. God had already prepared it. If Adam made the wrong choice, my son Jesus is going to die for humanity. The Bible says Christ was revealed in the last times for you. When Christ came on the scene, he was coming for us. He was coming to redeem mankind. He was coming to redeem the earth. I'm so grateful today I see and I, I, I love Christ so much because I understand why he came to the world. He came, the Bible says, took on the form of man and our sins were placed on him. You remember when Jesus and John came together and John saw Jesus for the first time? Look at this, John chapter 1, verse 29. It says, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. Listen, saints, Jesus is the only answer to take away sin. It's not uh, 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 Mohammed. It's not Allah. It's not Buddha. It's Jesus and Jesus only. This is the message that we must give to the world. He's the only one who died. He's the only one whose sins were placed on him to fix the sin problem. John said, behold the lamb. He's the one that's going to die for the sins of the world. And when he do, he's going to take sin from the world. I love my Savior. We know Jesus, he was delivered uh, of the Sanhedrin to the Romans. And as the Romans took him, the Roman soldiers, they mocked him and they beat him and they scourged him. And here in John chapter 19, verse 2, the Bible says that these soldiers, uh, they put, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they braided uh, a crown of thorns. Look at this. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And, uh, and, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. This was prophecy, saints. He went to the, he went to the cross. As he was going to the cross, the Roman soldiers beat him and they got a crown of thorns and they braided the crown of thorns and they put it into his brow. This was significant, saints. That crown of thorns, you know, the crown of thorns happened as a result of God cursing the earth. Not only did Jesus deliver mankind, but he also delivered creation. He delivered mankind. Now, I want to read something here about these crown of thorns that I thought was so beautiful. Uh, this is from God Questions website, and I love what they say about the crown of thorns. They said this, there is further symbolism embodied in the crown of thorns. When Adam and Eve sinned, bringing evil, uh, being evil and a curse upon the earth, 
bringing evil and a curse upon the earth, part of the curse upon humanity was cursed is the ground. Because of you in pain, you shall eat of it uh, all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you. Genesis 3, verse 17 and 18. The Roman soldiers unknowingly took an object of the curse and fashioned it into a crown for the one who would deliver us from that curse. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangeth on the tree. Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ in his perfect atoning sacrifice was delivered, uh, has delivered us from the curse of sin, of which the thorn is a symbol. While intended to be mockery, be a mockery, the crown of thorns was in fact an excellent symbol of who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. They put the crown of thorns in his head trying to mock him, but they were literally taking the curse of creation to the cross. Not only did Jesus die for mankind, he also died for the earth. And saints, I love so much, we're going to see here that he was crucified. Matthew 27, 35 says, and they crucified him. They killed him and they parted his garments. And see, the Bible tells us, we're going to see in a few minutes that if the devil knew what God was doing, he would have never killed Christ because Christ was the answer to fix this sin problem in the earth. This is one reason why every man, woman must accept Jesus today. You know, it's very hard to get good people saved because good people feel, well, preacher, I'm doing good. I don't kill, I don't steal, I don't do all that stuff. I'm a good person. But see, what they don't understand is that the stain of Adam's sin is on them from Adam. They must identify with the, with the resurrection of Christ in order to have life. Look at this. The cross. I love this. This is from the Living Way uh, uh, Library or the Living Word Library. Listen to what, listen to what it says about the cross. And, and this is showing God's foreknowledge of how he's going to redeem us. The cross, God's insurance policy. It is as if God, uh, it is as if to say God had taken out an insurance policy before creating mankind. It is a fully comprehensive insurance that pays for all damages no matter what and even promises to restore back as new. That insurance is the blood of Jesus. The main strength of the insurance, just like any normal insurance policy, uh, is that it is taken out before the incident. That is why it covers everything. Jesus' death on the cross was not uh, an afterthought by God rushed through uh, after the event of mankind falling into sin. No, it had been settled before. Saints, we see the love of God. Father God said, I'm gonna make a way in case Adam make a wrong choice. God says, I'm not gonna damn all of humanity because of Adam. Uh, I, I got a plan. Uh, I'm, I'm allow my son Jesus to die on the cross for them. I'm going to place all of their sins on Jesus and all mankind has to do is, is identify, is accept him. And as they do, a transference will take place. I love this. Paul said this because see the devil, the devil didn't know what God was doing. First Corinthians two verses seven and eight. He said, Paul said, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the, before the world uh, unto our glory. He said, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord. See, if the devil would have known that killing Jesus was going to redeem humanity, he would have never done it. The devil thought, man, I got him. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to take him out. I'm going to do it. And when he did, he fell right into the hands of God to redeem mankind. God says, set up. So you took my son, but what you did you took all of humanity's sin that I laid on him for them. And all they got to do is identify with him and they're going to have life. Look at this. I love this. He said in Romans uh, 5, 15, he says, not by the offense. So he says, not, uh, but not as, uh, as the offense. So also is the free gift. For if through the offense 
of one, many be dead because of Adam's sin, we all died. He says, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, have abounded to many. See, Adam plunged all of us into sin. But what Jesus did, if you accept him, you will abound toward grace. The Bible said we saved by grace. It's not of works that any man should boast. You can't live good enough to go to heaven. What you got to do is identify with Christ. Accept Jesus as your savior and you'll have eternal life. I'm almost done. Second Corinthians 5, 21, my, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Look what it says. For he, God, have made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus didn't know sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. At Calvary, saying all of our sins was placed on Jesus. And it was at that moment, Jesus, he looked up to heaven and he said, God, why have thou forsaken me? You know, the scripture tells us that God will not forsake us. But there was one person who God did forsake. It was his son at Calvary. When our sins were placed on him, God turned his face away from his son. Jesus felt loneliness that he had never experienced in his entire life. He said, why have thou forsaken me? Our sins were on him. Jesus paid the price for us. Today, if we accept Jesus as our Savior, as we identify with his death, burial, and resurrection, we believe in it, we'll have this life. He takes our sin to Calvary, and we take his righteousness. Look at this. I love this. Romans 5, 17. Paul says, for if by one man's offense, Adam, death reigned by one, much more they which receive, you got to receive it, you got to receive it. They which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. See, we all was condemned because of Adam. But here Paul said here, he said, listen, if you receive this abundance of grace, and you receive the gift of righteousness, he says, you're going to reign in life. You're going to reign eternally with God. You know, salvation is, is so simple that men reject it. Men think, I got to crawl on my knees. I got to do penance. I got to do something to go to heaven. You know, it, it's that, that just accepting Jesus and believing on him, that's too easy. But that's how God did it. God says, I know you can't keep the law. You know, saints, it's more than 10 commandments. It was 613 laws that the Jews were required to keep. You want to go to the law? Go to all 613 of them. God knew that man couldn't keep it. That's why he sent his son to die in our place. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven, saints. I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus in the new earth. You know why I'm going there? Not because I live good. Not because I'm a good man. I don't steal, kill, smoke, do all this stuff the world do. Not because of that. I'm going to heaven because of what he did. It takes the struggle out of being a Christian. See, if you're struggling to live, you're trying to cross all the T's and dot all the I's, you have not entered into his rest. See, the Bible says we enter into the rest of what he has done. You enter into his rest. I'm saved because of what he's done. Almost done. Got a few more verses. Almost done. Second Peter 3, 13. Peter said, nevertheless, we according to his promise. Look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Because what Christ has done, has done, there's going to be a new world, saints. A brand new world without sin, a brand new world without, without, without sorrow. Revelation 21, 4, he says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are past. Because what Christ has done, where we are going, our eternity with God is going to be beautiful. Can you imagine a world without pain, saints? Can you imagine a world where we'll never, ever, ever lose a loved one? We've, we've lost a lot, of, uh, a lot of great people. One of my spiritual fathers, Dr. Tim LaHaye, he just passed on a few weeks ago. Now, he's entered into his glory. I mean, uh, I'm rejoicing that he's in heaven, but I miss him. He's, in, he's, in, he's entered into his glory. There's coming a day we will never, ever lose a loved one. Ever. This is, this is eternity. I'm going to close with this last verse. And this is, the res, this is the end result of what God has done through his son dying for us. I love this. Revelation 22, 3 says, and there... 
shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. When we enter the new world, the Bible says there should be no more curse in there. Thorns and thistles would not be a part of the eternal world. Pain, sorrow, death would not be a part of that eternal world. We will spend eternity the way God originally wanted Adam and Eve to have it. A world joyous, a world full of peace, not a world full of calamity like we're experiencing it today. You got to understand, saints, this world today is not your home. In the book of Hebrews, the, prophet, I mean, the, the, the writer of Hebrews said that we are pilgrims passing through. You know, we're not attached. You know, don't, don't lock all of your attentions in this present world because everything on this side has been infected with sin. I think I mentioned one time I was here before about, you know, you know, things that we have. We have things, but you know, things left to themselves, they die. Buy a brand new car and put it in your garage. Don't drive and see what happens. Come back to it five years later and see them tires, nice tires. You never wrote, drove on them. They, they crack and rotten. Why? Because it's part of a dead system. This present evil world. Jesus died to give us life.